there, and welcome to the Untitled Film Podcast with Callum and Johnny. I'm Johnny. And I'm Callum. And hello this week. We are back in the studio a few days late because somebody had to go and get a pandemic-style illness. Yep, I had the old uh, death-warmed-up feeling for about a week. And I I should just mention, just before we recorded, we do a couple of uh, test, you know, goes at it. He forgot the title again in the test. Actually, I'm not even sure if it was the test. I think that was just take one. <laughs> I th- and we're now into take two. The first take t- no, this is just take three because the first one, the audio wasn't right. But And he <laughs> called it the Two Johnnies podcast <laughs> again. Well, you try having two podcasts. How, how can, you haven't had that podcast <laughs> for like two years now. You you don't have this excuse. It just anymore. rolls off the tongue better than untitled podcast with Callum and Johnny. The untitled film podcast with <laughs> Callum and Johnny. Well, same deal. Yeah, but it's it, this is a start of a brand. We're gonna have the untitled. We've got the untitled film podcast. Then we'll have the untitled TV, TV podcast and TV and, then and untitled movies. politics and then untitled Formula One, which you won't be involved in. And, I probably won't be involved and, with the politics either. Well, we'll find out. But yeah, we will. Uh, you know, it's going to be an untitled branding exercise. And speaking of branding, we've taken that first little baby step into the world of branding by finally getting some socials. We have some social media pages, and I'm forgetting the titles of them now. So don't forget to like and subscribe to the thing that Callum now can't remind me the titles for. I'm just going to go, and we are on. Facebook and on Instagram as Untitled Film Podcast, one word. We're also on Twitter as well, but we had to come up with quite a convoluted title because of that ridiculous 15 character limit. So I actually do have to remind myself of what we are on Twitter because it's something... It's, it's un- untitled with C and J or something. No, it's, it? it's at untitled... Yes, it's, it's at untitled with C, J. I tried to get C and J, but they couldn't fit and somebody had already gone for untitled film pod which was all it would allow it wouldn't allow podcasts and this is what happens when i leave callum in charge of something i can't help it that untitled film pod because it wouldn't allow the c-a-s-t was already taken the one title that we have was taken by somebody else it's just not it's not my fault but we do have some um listener feedback what do you mean by listener feedback? Oh, really? let's, I let's go do out. have to. It's full, full disclosure here. At the moment, this is just our friends. Uh, but the, <laughs> the cool thing about you guys listening to us and going, huh, I think I'll I'll sign up to that Instagram thingy. What I've heard of and that Facebook thing is that eventually you'll be able to have your stuff read out as well. But well, we do well. have a couple of things. But- or yeah. one thing, actually. Really, just one. We have, no, two comments. One detailed, one less detailed. So, one of the first things that we want to do with socials, as, as most people do, is interaction with their followers. Interaction. And um, I put out a little question. And, yes, and we have uh, two well, comments. What was the question, though, first? The, Come on. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Just don't, oh, yeah, we've got two comments here. So oh, the, Come on, context. Question for the day. What's the worst movie you have ever seen in the cinema? And why? Best replies will be read out on Monday. Now recording on Wednesday. And what was out on Thursday? (laughs) And what was the what was the no? What was the the picture? The picture is of um, happy. No, name of the film. It's uh, what's the the, I can't remember the name. I can't remember the film either. But it's the the very iconic is garbage Garbage day. Day. And I I call myself a horror fan. I can't remember the name of that film. That's a biggie. Useless. Silent Night, Deadly Night 2. That's the one. Um, but anyway, we have one very detailed answer and one less so detailed. So I'll start with the less so detailed from Dog Brain Videos, our friend Chris Wade, a friend of the channel, friend of us. He just said, Questionable. The Happening. Yeah, I was with him when we watched The Happening together. Uh, had The Happening, the like, was it about 2009, I want to say? Maybe 2008 in that, in that neighbourhood. Yeah, um, M. Night Shyamalan movie. Um, starring Mark, Mark Wahlberg, Wahlberg and Zoe Deschanel. Deschanel? Two people Deschanel. I can usually like. Yeah, I mean, Mark Wahlberg's a bit of a prick, but... Yes. He, but yeah, and uh, I saw it with him. It was... I thought it was one of those films that's so bad, it's almost enjoyable, though. Um, where there are other films out there. Um, it's a film where someone tries to outrun the wind. 
So yeah. it, it can't be, it's not all bad. It's one of those things, It's it, it was a weird one. And I, Chris made a comment in it, actually. There's a bit, I, I, I'm probably going to spoil it, but I don't think anyone out there should probably watch it. So cares. There's a bit where Zoe Deschanel's in like a farm shed thing and Mark Wahlberg's in a house and there used to be a pipe that went underground for the maids to talk to each other or something. And um, they're sitting next to this pipe and they've been having a conversation. Oh, we can't go outside because of the wind. Oh, that wind. Oh, it's the wind that's doing it. And then they're quiet for a few seconds. And um, Mark Wahlberg's character goes, Jess, or whatever her name is. It's not probably not Jess. Jess is her name from New Girl. New Girl, yeah. Or whatever her name is. Um, and, and she goes, yeah. And he goes, I was just checking you're still there. And Chris just went... Well, she's not going to be outside, is she? And literally the whole, like, when I say the whole cinema, there was about three people in there, but everyone started cackling with laughter. So, yeah, it was, it was That's quite good fun. fun. I thought it was quite fun. And M. Night Shyamalan, bad M. Night Shyamalan is fun, M. Night Shyamalan. Yeah. Um, our second comment is from Howard, our friend Howard, and he was a, a lot more detailed. And he chose Pixie, the film from 2020. which Not think, Pixel. Not Pixel, as um, Johnny first thought. But Pixie, an uh, Irish film from a couple of years ago, which actually we both saw together and we, we quite liked it. It wasn't world shattering or anything, but it was pretty good. But his details were, it's neither good enough nor bad enough to remember. It's a room temperature gu- glass of milk, a very erudite. A really shockingly bad film will still leave you talking about how bad it, it was. But Pixie struggles to elicit even the slightest emotional reaction. It leaves you struggling to remember if you even went to the cinema that day. A truly bad film can still be a guilty pleasure, but this film I had to Google to remember the name. Everything about the film is bland and uninspiring, almost designed to leave viewers entirely apathetic to what they have just seen. Sheer, tepid mediocrity. Ouch. I, I mean, I mean that is pretty Ouch. harsh and biting. Um, Gosh, kind Howard. of half agree because I, if you hadn't said a, if, if you hadn't said, well, the, the fact that my brain first went to a different film when I read it, uh, uh, and I didn't kind of, worse film as well. Yeah, exactly. Which I suppose when I'm fishing for like bad movies, that's probably why my probably brain went there. You're... But it is pretty like middle of the road. It like, is. It is. So I can <laughs> I can understand where he's coming from from that point of view. Um, but I kind of like enjoyed it when I was watching it. I think. And who was again? This doesn't this this kind of falls into is it is it Alec Baldwin yes yes Alec he plays Baldwin. a priest doesn't yeah he? I was like there's some weird I'm sure there's With some the weird I hate you to tell you I am there I'm the Irish oh I'm Alec Baldwin being Irish oh diddly 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 day yeah it's quite a strange film I, I, I'd watch it again and in the and same on film Sunday, if I was a bit you have a, in the background. the really talented Olivia Cook, who is one of these young actresses that are just putting the world to shame can do any accent and uh, some Irish friends of mine said, yeah, great accent. So, you know, swings and roundabouts, same film. You've got Alec Baldwin and Olivia Cook. I also thought that she was Irish in yeah, it, when I was we, watching it, which is pretty... That, that was my assumption good. too. I, I thought she, she was Irish as well. So, yeah. Uh, so sign up to those social medias. We'll put out more questions and you'll be the first maybe you'll... non-friend to uh, get your stuff read out. Or at the moment, probably more likely another different another friend, friend, maybe. Yeah. Or maybe the same two friends. Again, the same two friends. So you just keep we'll badgering out. Howard for really de- detailed and erudite answers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, going on from there. So what is this week's podcast about? Well, this week's podcast is about underground comics both an adaptation and a film that's inspired by the world of underground comics. We have the new film from Owen Klein, son of Kevin Kevin Klein. Um, Not Calvin Klein. Not Calvin Klein. No, uh, the very talented actor Kevin Klein. He was once a child star. He was in The Squid and the Whale, a very good film. Uh, But he seems to be more interested in directing. And something just fell off Johnny's wall. That's what you probably heard there. Um, (laughs) But his new film, the indie hit... Funny Pages, about it's a coming-of-age film about a young man who is kind of obsessed with this world of underground comics. And we also have the uh, very wonderful, and that's a bit of a spoiler for what our opinion, or my opinion at least, will be, 2001 film Ghost World, starring Thora Birch and Scarlett Johansson, in both in very early roles in their careers. 
Yeah, that is exactly what this week's podcast is about. But before we get to that, it is time for the news. And oh, we should go first. My well, f- la <laughs> So there's, I've, both of us have a feeling that we, we don't tell each other what news we're doing before, which can, as you could probably guess, has a huge room to backfire. And I think today this might, it might end up being the first one that it does backfire, because I feel like we've probably both gone for one of these pieces of news. But we'll see. We'll see. We'll, we'll see indeed. So my first piece of news is that Ryan Reynolds... You son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> you son of a bitch. <laughs> You son of a bitch. <laughs> you has bought a football club in no. Wales. Oh. No, it's not ah. thing. I'm joking. I'm joking. But he has bought a football club in Wales with uh, Rob McElhenney from Always Sunny Philadelphia. Great series on uh, Disney Plus at the moment about it. But uh, no, it is that Ryan Reynolds has announced that Wolverine is back. Boo, 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 boo. In Deadpool 3. And uh, yeah, he, he, he's brought the Wolverine is getting his claws and attaching them back on. Will he sing and dance his way in there like the greatest showman? We'll find out. But yeah, so that is my first piece of news. Are you excited for that? I'm very excited. That's why I chose it for my first piece of news. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, Deadpool. I love Deadpool 1. Deadpool 2, I've seen twice on a plane, I think. and can't really remember much about it, apart from the fact Josh Brolin's in it. Um, but this, I feel like the fact that um, Hugh Jackman's going to be in this makes it good. I keep on wanting to call Hopefully. him Huge Ackman. Why? Because it just sounds like it rolls better that way. Does it? I don't, I don't know I like if I agree with that. But <laughs> <laughs> um, So my first piece of news, who cares? I just literally found this on the um, <laughs> deadline, struggling to find something. But there's going to be a TV show of Time Bandits. Time Bandits, the uh, Terry Gilli- Gilliam film, and it's going to star Lisa Kudra from Friends. And, yeah, it's kind of. I'm sorry for about this. It's kind of tepid news. Like <laughs> that you know, was yeah. really funny. <laughs> That's my other piece of news as well. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I literally just kind of pulled this out. Time Bandits. Time Bandits. I literally Terry just, Gilliam, I, Apple TV, Kudro, because I get Taika a, a lot of my news from uh, Deadline. Yeah, so when when uh, as well. when Fuck this, haven't we? <laughs> when when Johnny stole my piece of news, I was literally kind of scrambling. Uh, Deadline, yeah, get, get the link. And... Well, I saw it on Instagram and then forgot about it and then saw an Empire again, and that's why and I yeah, it's it, going to so. be made by Taika Waititi, whose current series Our Flag Means Death is a big hit at the moment. I think that's with HBO. Um, this is going to be an Apple series, and yeah, it's going to be good fun. Um, we like Terry Gilliam a lot here. We like Lisa Kudrow, just fine, I guess. Um, Taika Waititi, big thumbs up in our book. Um, yeah, it's going to be good fun. Now you know how it feels. <laughs> <laughs> wow, absolutely no, but I, I agree. Taiko, like Taiko. It's Taika. Ta- is it Taika? Oh, it's Taiko. No, it's it's got an A on the wow. end. I don't know how, I'm not, my, is it Maori? Maori? It's Maori, yeah. My Maori pronunciations are probably not great. So apologies if I'm saying it wrong. Apologies if Callum's saying it wrong. Let us on the back of the postcard. I'm sure he listens to this podcast, so please let us know the correct way to say it. We've just lost our entire Maori audience. Maybe. Uh, yeah, well. But anyway, yeah, now I'm excited. Hence why I picked it as one of my pieces of news. <laughs> so... I don't have another piece of news. I think you have a backup piece of news, so you can have a second piece of news. Well, this isn't so much um, kind of new movie news. This is box office news and two bits of nice box office news. I hear everyone yawning. (laughs) I'm I'm a box office nerd, I have to say, but there are two quite exciting pieces of box office news. The first is less exciting. It's that the new Jurassic World film has been the second film this... Sorry, no, the third film after Spider-Man, Top Gun to join the Billion Dollar Club since the pandemic. What? Yeah. Only just scraped by. But it, the universally panned. The universally anyone, panned. I know like two people that have seen it all hated it. I saw it on Instagram, like Chris Pratt and Bryce Alice Howard were posting stories about how exciting, we've joined the Billion Dollar Club again. But yeah, it's joined the Billion Dollar Club. Hollywood celebrating mediocrity. But there is a slightly more exciting thing. Have you heard of a film called The Woman King with Viola Davis and John Boyega? No, but I like both of them. There's so this film, uh, The Woman King, about a um, 
African, it, it's uh, set in the, I think, the 18th century in Africa, um, and it's about an army of uh, mostly women soldiers fighting against uh, colonialists. Colonialists? You know, the blah, blah, blah. Um, it, it hasn't set the world on fire in terms of box office. It opens to a still unexpectedly good 19 million for an original film, mostly black cast, mostly female cast, um, still something to celebrate. But it's the second film after Top Gun Maverick to get that coveted A plus uh, cinema score. And an A plus cinema score leads to very leggy um, box office yeah. returns. And we've seen it's been out in its second week and it's only dropped something like 43% in its second week, which is quite unheard of for original movies. It seems to be taking maybe America really well. Maybe people are just fed up of re-warmed up shite like the Pinocchio we had to watch last Absolutely. week. Absolutely, and it's got ver very good reviews. It's got something in the mid-70s on Metacritic. Uh, it's getting reviewed bombed by the usual <coughs> white supremacist troll sons of Cunts. bitches. Cunts. Um, that you expect. So it's got something terrible like a 5... Point two or something on, on IMDb, you know, something that's it's not deserving of, I'm sure. I mean, I'm, we'll make our own minds up when we see it. But um, otherwise, audiences, A plus means audiences are really, really going for it, and it's become a really big hit, and it's something to celebrate. A plus score is a very rare thing, and yeah, it's yeah, something yeah. really cool. And that, and I think uh, when it comes out, it'd be a good one to review. Maybe or maybe I think it's coming out in October over here. I actually do. Oh, you're knocking the microphone today. Oh, don't you do that. You're knocking the microphone it was him. today. It was him, listeners. <laughs> it was <laughs> not. Him. I just heard it going through your microphone. It probably was. At some point. I'm sure he did it as I'm, well. I've done it earlier in the yeah, podcast. Yeah, I didn't point it out. I was a gentleman. See, I've done it before and I don't want to do it again. He has a much easier setup. Well, you know, people on, I, on I don't Instagram know what too. you mean. I just don't know what you mean. I'm not going to keep knocking it so that you can take a picture. Okay, go on. We've got to pipe up the socials. But this is not good radio. You hurry up. I can't keep doing this. <laughs> it takes quite a while to get to Instagram. Okay, okay. I'll, just, I'll just pause until you're ready. Okay, you can go now. Okay, okay. I don't know what you mean. Knocking the microphone is something you do. I don't knock the microphone ever, it's ever, a ever. It's a picture. You don't have to keep doing it. Okay, sorry. Sorry about that. You can tune back in now. now. This is terrible radio. I'm sorry. But yeah, um, I did have another piece of box, box office news that I thought of while you were talking about box office news that I didn't even have to Google. Um, <laughs> Avatar is, I think, number one at the box office in the US at the minute, isn't it? Or it's certainly above the, Don't yeah. Worry Darling. Uh, yes, I think it has done very well. It's had a re-release. Who knew that people still gave a shit about Avatar? I think it might be number three. I think it's okay. uh, Don't Worry Darling, uh, The Woman King. No, it's above Don't Worry Darling. Oh, it is? It's made more money oh, this geez. week than Don't Worry Darling oh, has. Okay, maybe that's number Which one. Which is also depressing. Don't Worry Darling and then The Woman King at number three. I didn't know that new cinemas being built still had 3D as well, but apparently... Apparently they do. They do, because apparently they've been showing it in 3D. And the the... Our local cinema, the Curzon, who's just opened a brand new, even bigger, better Curzon, and it's wonderful. And they have three D screens. And I thought, if I, if I was like building a cinema in twenty twenty two, and was chick ticking the boxes on the projectors, like, oh, it's five hundred pounds more, probably a lot more than five hundred pounds more, but it's five hundred pounds more for for three D. Nah, I'll leave that box unchecked because who cares a shit about three D anymore? But evidently, yeah, apparently, still people do. Yeah, well. Wow. I mean. Blimey Charlie. Anyway, on to the new movie. Is it of time the for the week. magic? It is time for the magic. I think it's, as ever, I think it's all magic apart from you hitting the microphone constantly. But well, I mean, that was a bit. Uh, <laughs> it's a bit that's probably more funny to, to, to you than it is to the audience. But to me and no one else. To the readers, as Rory Stewart would say. <laughs> Uh, when I listen to the Rest is Politics podcast, another podcast plug here, uh, Roy Stewart always accidentally says the readers instead of the listeners. Oh, sad old man humour. It's always good. He doesn't do it on purpose. It's an accident. <laughs> but anyway. Um, so, movie number uno is Funny Pages. It certainly is. And who would like to do the synopsis on this? Should, would you or shall I? Uh, I'll, I'll go for it. You yeah. go for it. It's about a young man. Um, he's kind of he's just in the stage of his life where he's about to go to university, but he's obsessed with these uh, kind of the Robert Crumb era of um, uh, 
uh, of comic books of, of this kind of uh, uh, the dark world of uh, indie comic books so not the superhero kind of stuff uh, he's a really talented draw uh, artist and drawer and he loves his drawings and he has a friend who seems to idolize him kind of weirdly idolize him and is trying to do his own drawings but they're decidedly less good and at the start of the film and uh, it's the very start of the film so i'm not sure if we're categorizing this as a spoiler but um he has a mentor a guy that's kind of teaching him how to draw how to get better as an artist for these for this underground comic scene and he dies very quickly and very tragically and in a kind of a fit of grief he steals the his art bag that was in his studio he breaks his window break breaks and gets his art bag and is taken to court for it and you know they decide they kind of they drop it very quickly it's like this is a uh, you know this is a, a grief-stricken young man who wants to get his art back you know hardly a criminal mastermind and the woman at court gives him a job taking notes that's where she he meets a series of kind of oddballs and weirdos and one such weirdo comes in you know he's taking notes for this guy who's got an upcoming court case because he uh, thrashed a pharmacist and he has seems to have this weird grudge with the pharmacist and at some point during the uh, uh, note taking he realizes that this guy used to be a colorist or an assistant colorist as he keeps assisting uh insisting for uh, image comics and of course this guy being a, a comic book obsessive he becomes weirdly fixated with this potentially very dangerous and very weird and probably mentally ill man and not to say any more but that's that's the, the uh yeah that's the so now too. callum's giving you the first 75 percent of the movie <laughs> um yeah what did you think it's a film that i had to sleep on actually a little bit at first i it's not that i didn't like it i appreciated a lot of it for its uh indie kind of uh kind of grotty aesthetic it very much felt like a Robert Crumb book, or at least the characters did. Like, kudos to the casting director for finding the weirdest looking people on the planet. Because every person that this guy interacts with, whether it's his landlord, the guy that ends is kind of a slum sort of landlord, he's living in a basement with uh, another guy, and uh, who's, you know, they share a bedroom. But his roommate, his best friend, the guy that uh, his mentor, the comic book um, the guy teaching him how to draw better, um, the the guy that he becomes obsessed with, who drew, drew for Image Comics, there's some strange looking people. They look like the kind of people from a Robert Crumb or Harvey Picard novel. So kudos, kudos for that. But I did in, have to in, speak uh, on it. I was saying, interestingly enough, a lot of those people are on when you go on IMDb, are like character actors that haven't had a job in 10 years but used to be in loads of things and stuff like that that. it's quite interesting there are several of them who haven't had a job in quite a while but at first the film annoyed me a little bit because i just kind of felt like owen klein being the son of kevin klein he can hardly know this world himself it started to feel a little bit like a, a case of an indie poser and which is sometimes a feeling i've had with some of the a24 films of which this is that it's rich kids playing in the slums and at its worst a24 has this that kind of uh, aesthetic they want to be seen as in the indie world of uh, the hal hartley's the richard uh, young richard linklater's that kind of thing but they have a sort of snooty hipper than thou feel to it and it kind of annoyed me but then i realized well, that's the point. But it took a while, it took several days after I saw the film to kind of realize that that's the point. The kid in the movie, he comes from a nice family. He's, this is a, a poser writing about a poser. I, I was just, funny enough, I was just about to go, Callum, you, do you know how wrong you are? The whole point is he is a poser. He's a poser in this world. He, he's thrown away the, shack, the shackles in his mind the shackles of oppression that is his well-to-do middle-class parents yes and uh and gone to live in this basically like dodgy end of town that people keep telling him that's a dodgy end of town why are you living there in in a basement that he's not meant to live in that's full of steam and disgusting old men like it, yeah i love the line where he says it's really hot in here oh okay we'll, we'll turn the steam off for a bit we should keep it on every day though but we like to turn it off for a little bit yeah, we're not, we're not meant to turn it off. We're meant to keep it on every day, but we, we, we turn it off for a couple of hours. And no one can know you're living here. But no, it, it did take a while. It, it had to settle in for me. Because I just found myself being annoyed by him. Until I realised that I'm supposed to be annoyed by him. He's not a hero. 
Mm-hmm. He's a he is the kind of the, he's an eighteen year old. He's an eighteen year old who's trying to immerse himself in this world he's become obsessed with, as we've all done at some point, as we all do to an extent. Or whatever it is we will try to do, try to get into. We want to be a part of that world, man. It is. It is so. It, it gets that kind of. Basically, most eighteen-year-olds are pricks. Like, it's very true. It, it, yeah, you know, you think you're, you think you're hot stuff. You know everything. Your parents don't know anything, and blah, blah, blah. and literally, you know, everyone's a bit hot-headed, and they get, like you say, get obsessed with things and talk like they know know it all and and it's kind of this film is like the the uh the the that kind of ness it's distilled into movie. a movie um and that's so uh, for me there was a lot i really liked about the movie although it seemed to be set today because some of the stuff they talked about it had a very like late 90s early 2000s vibe like it could have almost been a kevin smith from a, like visually style wise and things it could have been like a Kevin Smith movie. They'd even done, you know, when you watch a '90s movie, there's a certain like grain that the film yes, had in those like days. A, it's like a like a, a peel of a film. Yeah, which you don't. It's, it was literally like as soon as the, the clock struck midnight on 2000, that just disappeared from all movies. But literally, even a 200 million dollar blockbuster had it. In, in the 2000s, in, sorry, in the 90s. Um, and it's a strange artifice. Yeah, and I quite like that. And that's, I think it kind of fits in nicely with Ghost World, which we're going to talk about in a bit, because actually visually very similar. Visually, it's a bit of a coming of age story that, I don't know, not to give too much away, maybe the person at the end of it isn't particularly happy with how it's turned out. Um, and, but, but here's the big but. It's fucking painful watch. Like it's hard work. It's really like exhausting to watch. To be honest, I felt the same. Um, and I uh, I saw this film with some colleagues and their friends. And at the end of it, I found myself going a lot to admire, difficult to love. Yeah, it was. And there was a couple of bits I was like, that's just gross for the sake of gross, or it just I don't. I almost think it they could have shaken it down to the more central story and maybe it would have been a more comfortable watch. But I suspect that's the point. I suspect it's not meant to be comfortable. I suspect it's meant to be difficult. But I did you know. find myself thinking, um, it's a shame we can't spoil this movie quite so much because there is something that happens at the end. Mm. And to an extent, I did find myself, and I think this is true for a lot of first-time writer-directors, they, get, they paint themselves into a, somewhat of a corner and then they go... How do I end this? And Let's they did do the kind of end abrupt. This. Yeah, do something abrupt, but also do a, and then do a. a oh, I really want to give the ending away. I know, I know. It's it's a movie that kind of where all roads lead to it, that it, thing. I'm just gonna say it does the indie thing that indie movies love to do, where, I mean, this isn't giving the ending away because this is just the thing that happens when the credits roll. It just like follows the person mournfully thinking about things <laughs> like the end of Lost in Translation or uh, Michael Clayton or like, so many movies and also something happens at the end that to be cryptic this is how Clerks would originally have ended with sudden something until someone said to Kevin Smith no knock it off it's not that extreme though is it not but... that extreme but it's in the same in the, in the same ballpark of that Thing. Yeah, it does kind of have a Kevin Smithy energy, but it's. I think the issue with it is it doesn't feel like a drama, but I think that's what it wants to be. It's not very funny, I didn't think anyway. It's too painful to be funny. It's, so I kind of feel like they probably were aiming towards dark comedy as well, but it wasn't really a dark comedy. No, I actually agree and... entirely. Um, so my uh, friend from work, he bought his girlfriend and his... <laughs> it's a weird movie to go and see oh, she, she's, a, she's a, a, a movie okay. person in fact he was the one kind of scratching his head going what what's it what and well she would and knocked it he, he did it this time that was he did me it. that was um, me and uh, but uh, her brother was visiting because uh, she's Californian and uh, he'd come down for the month and they had seen a bunch of movies because he's also a movie guy and it's really into the whole A24 scene they were howling with laughter mm-hmm. throughout the whole thing. So this, if you're into that A24 aesthetic, this is the comedy of comedy. How, how old were they? Oh, uh, I guess, I'm, I, to be honest, I don't know for certain, but I'm guessing mid to late 20s. Okay, because I was going to say, if I was at university, 
I would have thought this is the most profound movie of all time. In the same way that when I was at secondary school, university. Garden State. Exactly what I was about to say. Garden State, exactly. Like, oh yeah, that's Zach most... Raff just speaks to oh me. Oh my man. god, he just He's, like he just gets me. He just he just knows. I wish I can stare into the middle distance while listening to Coldplay while Natalie Portman comes and ser- serenades me with a ukulele. Yeah. Absolutely. No, it, it, that that kind of period where and it's interesting going back watching there's a few movies like that for me and some of them I go back and watch and I go no I still enjoy it It still holds up like Lost in Translation I love Lost in Translation it's a very good film but when I watch Garden State I'm like ooh this is a bit too much very navel gazing so navel gazing so pixie dream girl and Peter Sarsgaard is fantastic yeah he's the best thing in it and Zach Braff is wet um, yeah, but yeah, I, anyway, uh, but th- that's this is what I'm getting at. I kind of feel like if it had come out when I was 18, 19, 20, I would have been like, oh my God, this is the most profound thing. It speaks to me. It gets me. But it goes back to that kind of thing of when you're 18, you're a bit of a prick. <laughs> uh, you compared it to Kevin Smith. I think for me, a better comparison would be uh, Noah Baumbach, or at least yeah. early Noah Baumbach, because um, Owen Klein, he, he used to be an actor and he was the youngest brother in the squid, squid in the whale, whale. yeah, it's got that vibe. It has a similar too. thing, and that film is about also about a um, an annoying 70, 16, 17 year old. Um, so it's in that same world. I think, in a way, what I'm saying when I compare it with Kevin Smith, I think it's more the look and the the a certain grottiness. Yeah, whereas um, Squid in the Whale is quite kind of like I, I'm in New York in a fancy New York it's, school, it's and I'm living well in a played. in a nice. You know, it, it, brownstone it, house in New York and it, blah, 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 blah. it's more well behaved I wanted to say I said well played I meant well behaved um, I was also thinking Linklater again visually and yeah. grottiness Linklater which you mentioned earlier it's kind of got that vibe to it there is a performance it's like slackers or something out, uh, as we mentioned that he becomes somewhat obsessed with this assistant colorist as he keeps it, assi- insisting that he is and he's a, played by a character actor named Matthew Mayer who's had small roles here and there. Yeah, I've seen him in things before. Everything. He was excellent. Weird looking guy, but he is fantastic. It's a hard role to pull off without coming across as a caricature. And he gives him some real depth, real pain, uh, real tragedy to the whole thing. It's a very well played, very well judged character, which on the paper may have just been garden variety weirdo. And he's if at the end of the year we do one of those you know, what was your best performance of the year, best supporting, but and all that kind of stuff. He's an early contender for best supporting actor. He's really, really good. I found myself watching him a lot. Did you know who I was really impressed with as well? Who, very small role, but it was one of the ones that made me go, okay, you're like, what is this film doing? But also really well played. Big, uh, what used to be a very big household name, Louise Lasser. Used to be married was Woody Allen's first wife, I believe. Okay. And she had quite a hit TV series and things. Um, she was she was one of the hosts of the first season of SNL and got blacklisted from SNL from oh, for, no for idea. various reasons. Um, but anyway, she hadn't I don't think done any film roles for about 10, 15 years. I think she was in the National Lampoons, but she played the old lady in the pharmacist. So there's this old oh, lady in a pharmacist yes. who's like spitting mad for like wanting them to get him Prozac or, or something. Yeah, she she really made me feel like have they just found real people? Yeah. Sometimes these indie films do. They find real kind of you know people on the street who think well you should be in that movie. I actually found myself uncomfortable around her scenes or scene I should say. No, no, it was good. Um, but yeah, no, I I I I'm mixed on this film. I I like. I could see where it was going. I liked the intentions. There was some good acting in it. I liked it visually, but I, I, I don't think it quite hung together properly. I don't think it quite knew what it was. And I, I'm just getting to an age where I can't be bothered to watch like un, uh, uncomfortable nasal gazing, gazing things, which I probably would have done 10 years uh, yeah, ago. Like, like we said, at 18, this would have just hit the spot yeah. in the right way. Um, no, but I, I actually agree. I think um, my consensus when I when the lights came up in the cinema was a lot to admire, difficult to love. Um, because I have a, a similar problem of that even though it's the point, we're not meant to like this guy, we're not meant to like the world he's in, I did just find myself thinking, I should really have a bath after, after yeah, this. Yeah, it, it gets hard to like... Uh, it's a thing that things do it's kind of some like well, some not so well. in the grot. Yeah... But it also it's awkward grot. Like, obviously there's a lot of anti, anti-heroes anti in things at the minute, but he wasn't really an anti-hero either. It wasn't someone you were, like, going, 
oh yeah, Heisenberg, he's, he's a prick, but it's, I've used the word prick a lot today. <laughs> um, anyway, he's an asshole, and but, but we're but, rooting for but him. We're rooting for him because, although actually by the end you're rooting for Jesse, but that's another story and another yes. thing we'll talk about another day, Harry. But, but yeah, it's, um, you know, it, it just, uh, again, it's it just, just a bit unpleasant work. young man. Yeah. And the, that's the point. We get that's the point. But, but do I want to spend an hour and a half watching that? Yeah, to be in the company of someone who's just unpleasant to be around. Yeah. And, and pretty much everyone in it is, I, I kind of, and this is a thing that's get happening more and more as I get older, I kind of side with the parents. I'm like, well, the parents seem all right. His friend's okay, a bit weird, but okay. Yeah, he, uh, but everyone else is horrible. But, he, but, he's, but he's nice enough, but yeah. And it is a case of they, Harvey Picard, Robert Crumb, they're trying to create this world and it's through his perspective of these are the kind of grotty people that fill out my world, the, the, the oddballs, the losers. But how much do you want to spend time with those people? Mm. And in some well things, observed though it might be. But sometimes it works. Sometimes there are films out there like I don't know, going back to Link Later Slackers, which is basically just real people. And and uh, yeah, it's a mess of a film Slackers. But you, you, they've all he's picked engaging people. But these, for the most part, I believe it's just Slacker much. and Slackers is a different. Thing. Okay, well, Slacker then, not Hackers. Oh, another great movie. Yeah. A masterpiece of the 90s. I just thought I'd put that rope out there for Callum <laughs> to, to fall into. A trap. A trap, some would say. <laughs> yeah, like the ne- like one of the movies I picked for next week is also a trap for Callum. Drumroll, exciting tease. But yeah. we will uh, we'll talk about that next week. So, I think that concludes our discussions on Funny Pages. Yes. Moving on to Ghost World. So, Ghost World. I really, 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 really have always liked. This is one of those films that I watched when I was, not to spoil too much of the review, one of those films that I watched when I was like 18 and I was like, oh my God, this is the greatest thing of all time. So we'll see in a minute if it, if it does if it I, hold if up. I think it still holds up. But so basically it's about two friends and an old man. Uh, that's my synopsis. Middle aged. Well. No, he is middle aged. Um, he's probably meant to be about the age we are now, so he's definitely. He's played by he's Steve young. Buscemi in the night in the early two thousands. Yeah, how old is Steve Buscemi? Now? I would uh, now. I'm not sure, but I, if I guess, must be forty. Must be about forty in this. Yeah, I'd guess in his early forties. Young. He's young. He's a young man. He's, he's a very spri- young man. He's a spryly young man. Yeah, very young man. Anyway, um, so they are just about to embark on their last summer of high school. Um, and what will they do next? They they don't really like anything to do with school. Everyone's a bit lame. It's, it's quite Daria-esque in that kind of That was exactly vibe. the comparison I was going to make. Is it? Yeah, it's, yeah. Got, it's got so much Daria about it. I was watching it going, oh, I love Daria and I love this. But anyway, um, and it is a bit... I mean, even the two characters, Daria and Jane, you could put a lot of into yes. both of them. Um but yeah, and then they finish school, they're planning on getting jobs for the summer, and then going and getting their own apartment together. Um, but they also, they're very cynical at the world, everything's a bit silly, people are ridiculous. Um, and the two kind of characters are trying to fill time, really, you know, when you're, when you're 18 and it's the summer, rather than drinking, which is in America, so they can't, because they're not 21. What do they do with their time? Well, they decide to torment an old man. (laughs) (laughs) The eldest man ever on screen. (laughs) Probably about 40. (laughs) To torment a middle-aged man, then. Um, They... We've lost Steve Buscemi as a listener. (laughs) They, um, in the newspaper, see a Lonely Hearts ad, which they decide to reply to and go and sit in this diner and wait for this person to show up and lo and behold it's Steve Buscemi who is a very young sprightly man um, and they then one of them starts to feel a little bit guilty about it they follow him home to see what his life's like and they're like oh uh, and then realise and then one day they go past his apartment and he is selling records another big reason I liked it um, and he's a massive record collector it turns out um, and then the story goes on that's my that's not this. Yeah, well done, well done. At least I didn't give the whole movie away. I'm, alla- I know I'm allowed to with this one. So. Well, we're allowed to with this one, yes. So, yes. yeah. But it anyway. sh- should be said, uh, the linking 
tissue here is that this is based on a comic book by Daniel Klaus, who is one of the more re respectable and um, uh, celebrated of that indie comic scene mm -hmm. from around that time. He's been he's had several movies to his name. It's also directed by a man who's who uh, he directed the the documentary Crumb in the mid '90s, based on the life of Robert Crumb. So this is a guy who really knows his onions, and you can tell just in the aesthetic of yep. the world it feels like it's drawn it's there's kind of there's an inkiness to it yeah it does and they when i was reading the wikipedia page about it he went through try the way he he kind of colorized it and the colors they picked when they were you know doing the sets and, and putting people's clothes they did it on purpose to try and give it a comic book feel and it kind of points like the way they walk and things and the, the way the shots are done always there's kind of like peanut vibes you know there's that whole peanut oh, yes. thing do, with do, do, yeah do, with it looking sad with the head like the head going down do, do, do. Well, it, it's every kind of feels like that sort of stuff. dressed in in broad colors yeah every character except oh, even the two lead girls and their friends josh that they keep bugging is a friend of theirs who works at a a convenience store and, and has a car and, and has a car conveniently he's, he's the uh, friend they bug with the car they're all just uh, like a 10 percent weirder than reality so they have a similar vibe in, in the way that funny pages filled its world with these oddballs that you might see in the pages of robert crumb this has a similar but perhaps more nuanced look at it whereas funny pages was about a guy trying to find oddballs to fill his life with so he finds the weirdest creepiest ones these are just the kind of regular schmoes of suburbia punched up by about five to ten percent to make them slightly comic comic and, comic and, and and the way the shots were done and and things that you know there's been an eye to make it a bit comic -y. but without it being in your face if you didn't know it was a comic book movie you wouldn't know that but because you know uh, we it's know it's certainly based not on a, a comic deterrent book. it's not a, necess a necessity to go it's into not like it. scott pilgrim where you watch which i love but you're watching it and it's like color color cut 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 comic booky things blah 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 it's not like that it's just it the colors are a bit more exaggerated some shots are stylized in a way that makes it feel slightly comic booky it's very cleverly constructed in that way similar to something like uh tim button's edward oh, sorry edward scissorhands where he creates a world that's uh he the all the houses are just slightly too chocolate boxy to kind of give it that slight punch of even the real stuff the non uh, fantasy stuff in Edward Scissorhands has a slight air of fantasy to it, even the stuff, but it's not enough to kind of tip things over. Uh, this thing is completely um, suburban throughout, but it has a slight air of magic realism. There's a uh, something just like a, like a twist of lemon. So uh, one example is that one of the oddballs that they keep coming across is this old man who's actually an old man. Stop squeaking your chair. <laughs> Um, it's an actual old man not like a Steve Buscemi old man who's waiting for this bus and they, they say look the bus line it hasn't run here for ages and through the events of the film as the main character played by Thora Birch becomes more and more detached from her friend from her family from everything that's going on around her she keeps noticing this old man waiting for the bus where the bus line doesn't come and you know it's one of the last scenes then it comes and it's just little punches like that throughout the movie slight magic slight little bits and i'm mm. doing uh johnny's uh making fun of me because i'm doing these finger movements it's like a slight bits of magic in the air um <laughs> but it's true there is a slight uh touch of magic realism to it just to sell the the suburban dread the the kind of the the malaise of kind of being a teenager in suburbia when nothing happens and when you've got nothing to do the little touches like uh, there's another guy in the convenience store who keeps coming in keeps bugging josh he's like this muscle bound guy he's got a sunburn he, 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 he's <laughs> stupid like he's got i've seen mullets. him in things before i feel like he was a thing at the I, time i think he might have been a kind of comedic character actor yeah. that was very popular in the early to mid 2000s um but i think that character type there's a similar kind of character in Napoleon Dynamite. Mm. It's like a, a dumb, a dumbo redneck sort of guy. 
Um, and he is uh, he's another one of these oddballs that you just wouldn't f- see in real life but it's there to sell I don't know you possibly do <laughs> if you've ever walked down Canterbury High Street <laughs> well, yeah that's true <laughs> but it, it's another character it's an exaggeration to sell the idea of this this dead malaise of things that are going on yeah it's it's an interesting one so going rewinding back more to the kind of plot so as the plot goes on, um, the the protagonist, um, I forgot her name in the movie, but anyway, she be- befriends the, the Steve Buscemi character um, and then they realise they've got a lot in common. There's a whole storyline of her kind of realising actually maybe what she doesn't want to do is move, uh, and as you kind of alluded to, she moves away from her friends and family, or, or like not physically moves away but, but, but kind she of mentally becomes, moves um, away she ali- becomes alienated from yeah her. she she kind of starts to want do you want to do something different um and 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 yeah uh, yeah and it's it the storyline um progresses and and she kind of gets further and further away and then then something major happens and she has the, the kind of rug pulled from under her and then she kind of runs back to those things um so it, it, yeah it is and and i think again it's kind of, <laughs> where again we've we've kind of lucked into picking two films that really almost follow each other in that his film is about kind of emancipating himself a bit from his parents and he thinks the rest of the world doesn't really understand him and he kind of pick finds these kind of middle-aged iconic figures that he wants to base himself on more than than that and then eventually has the rug pulled out from under him and it she kind of follows the same um the same path except she is a kind of person you can identify with and is enjoyable to be in the company of to an extent. And, you know, okay, has a moment or two of being an 18 year old, but actually is a, you know, also is a more well-rounded <laughs> character, ironically for something that's more comic booky. Um, and, and all the, the kind of secondary character, the Steve Buscemi character is very well-rounded and you enjoy him and you kind of, you know understand him and and i think that's the difference although in a way there's a kind of a similar arc through this and there's a certain naval gazeliness to it and it is a coming of age movie as they in like to say in Hollywood. Marks, a coming of age for, for the ages. ages for the ages but anyway um as it's, it's one of them um the difference to me one of the big ones is other than it's a bit less surreal is that I actually like the majority of the characters and I can see where most of the characters are coming from. There's some odd balls around, there's some weird bits going on and I stuff. I find that the characters are more well-drawn here. Yeah. So I think the point about... But Ba-dum-tsh. Well-drawn. <laughs> <laughs> Get out of my life! <laughs> I, I, I find that the characters here, so the Steve Buscemi character is... He's a necessary moment of stillness in a slightly crazy world uh, whereas in funny pages the oddballs are increasingly odder and odder mm. and odder here the you know she befriends a middle age and he's a bit of a sad sack a uh, bit of a loser but he's he's a kind of nice guy you can i'm kind of happy in his own skin happy, in his own little world happy doing what he's doing and yeah you, you said that enid uh, i think her name is enid uh, yeah i think it is yeah i think now you've said it she's she can be annoying, but in a way that you never find yourself being annoyed with. No, you don't turn against her. You're like, oh, I can see the mistake you're making here. Don't do that. Yeah. But but not like, why would you do that? And I think that? by being slightly more surreal and slightly more uh, larger than life, and I'm going to do finger movements again to be slightly But it's not. More... I think that funny... It's a weird one because funny pages is kind of grittier. But also... Aesthetically. Aesthetically, but the characters so, and everything are so out of the box, so un, un, like realistic. And, well, I guess and, the and, point I was trying to make is that greater truths are alluded to by having an, an aesthetic that's slightly more comic booky and with touches of magic realism than in funny pages, which purports to be gritty handheld cameras, aesthetically more grounded, but with characters you can't identify exactly. With. Yeah, it, it is, and it's it, it's interesting. And well, we do this on purpose, of course. We've picked two films that I think really parallel each other. One that I probably would never watch ever again, and one that is yeah. it's probably the fourth time I've watched it, and probably the first time I've watched it for a chunk of time for like seven or eight years. Same. And for me, it's still really held up. I still really like the characters. 
I still like the aesthetic. I still just got on with everything about it, really. Uh, and it still, uh, and actually made me see a different idea of the ending, actually, for, for it. So, we obviously, this is a big spoiler warning, but we're allowed to talk about spoilers in, in film number two. Um, so the ending has Enid getting onto that bus. So she's kind of moved back in with her life and she's kind of, you know, gone, gone along with it. And then Enid gets on the bus that the old guy got on and you see it, you see her disappearing off into the is- distance. And my thought, first thought was, I didn't think of this before, but is that bus a metaphor for death? Oh, that's very good. And then I looked on the... So has she felt so alienated she's committed suicide is what I would kind of partially drew from that. I have to say I didn't get that myself, but um, but no, that's a good reading. But I... So then looked at Wikipedia after I, I, after I watched the film, doing some research for this, sort of about things, and then there's a big bit on Wikipedia about it. Did not know this, hadn't seen this before. Suicide theory. And it's got the writer and the director talking about it. And I can't remember which way around it is, but one of them in one interview says, that is a good theory. You can definitely take that away from it. I'm not saying that's right or that's wrong. And then I think the director said, no, I'm not, I didn't mean that by it. Or one of them said, but one of them kind of alluded to maybe he did, the writer, I think, alluded to, he kind of did, did maybe kind of allude towards that in the writing. So yeah, but but that kind of gave me a bit of pause. I'm like, oh, have I seen this? Which is quite... Dark, you, you kind of, when I watched it before, kind of thought it's not like a happy ending, but it's an ending where things feels like they've moved on a bit. I but certainly actually, felt myself being more ambiguous with the ending, like it was a, a metaphorical journey into the, finally taking that next step. Mm. Like uh, I thought that kind of she would stop her rebellious ways and finally move in with the apartments that her friend, played by Scarlett Johansson, keeps badgering her about. She'd finally get a job. She'd finally maybe kind of trying to take. Her artwork a bit more seriously because um, throughout the film there's a subplot where she has to go back to a kind of you know, summer school sort of thing. She didn't pass arts and now she has to again. And she likes to draw little caricatures and cartoons of people. Another link. Another link, yes. Um, and that goes horribly wrong because she finds an image in uh, Steve Buscemi's house of an old racist uh, piece of artwork from a, um, a, a chicken shop that they then whitewashed. And she tries to get the point across, like, here's a depiction of how whitewashing happens, but the art is misinterpreted as just being racist. And she's offered a uh, place in sort of a, yeah, a scholarship. Like a really prestigious art school. And, and then that's and... taken away from her. But I sort of saw the ending as being more ambiguous to she's just going to be more open to trying things. So it's interesting to see that uh, the, end, the ending has uh, divided a little bit. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But I still think that as overall the film held up. I still really enjoyed it. Great acting from both of them. Steve Buscemi's great in it. All the kind of secondary characters and there's some kind of famous Fantastic character actors writing in there. and directing. Yeah. And the script is written also by Daniel Klaus, who wrote the comic books. It's an adaptation of his own work. And it's not too long. It's the right, you know, it's the right kind of length. There's, you know, there's not much to dislike about it, really. Yeah, everything, everything holds together. Everything works in tandem with it, with itself. It really does. So that, I think, brings us to the end of our film review. Puts a little bow on things, wraps it all up. So as we like to, at the end of this podcast, give a little, a little... A little tie up and a little score out of 10 for each movie. So, first off, Callum, I'm going to ask you about Funny Pages. I really struggled with Funny Pages. I think if, I, if you'd asked me just as I came out of the cinema, I would have said four out of, five, uh, four out of ten um, because I really found myself finding it unpleasant. And that idea of uh, Owen Klein being a poser sort of irks me for a bit. I thought of him as just being this coffee shop hipster sort of. Uh, before I realised that was the point, how much you enjoy that, even though that is the point, is something else entirely. But I think I'll bump it up slightly to 5 out of 10. I, I still found myself, like like Johnny, being very mixed on it. And there were lots of things that, while I found myself going, oh, I, yeah, I can see what they're doing there, still find myself, you know, just feeling like I'm swimming in the grot and not quite holding together in the way I think it thinks it does. And so I really liked it from a filmmaking point of view. I liked how it looked, that kind of 90s look. 
It was a nice hour and 30 minutes long. I liked some of the, the, the shots and some of the ways it was done. But my big issue with it is I just think the characters are just so unlikable that I just didn't really enjoy watching that much. So again, for sim, I, I didn't fall into the trap of thinking it was a, a kind of a posery coffee shop thing because I was like, well, no, that's the whole point. That's why the parents are rich. But I just just didn't like them. So again, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a two. Oh, sorry, two? a four. Jeez, a four for the filmmaking. Um, but I'm not really gonna give it anything for the story. So I'm gonna give it a four out of ten. Oh, okay. Uh, so yeah. So four four point five out of ten in total. So with that ringing endorsement, maybe you'll get to see it, maybe you won't. It's available to stream on Cinema. There Curse is a lot cinema. to admire about it. I would still suggest watching it, even if you find yourself going, eh, it wasn't for me. And I reckon 18-year-old me would have given it an 8 out of 10. So if you're 18, maybe it's for you. This is the best thing since Zach Braff picked out an upper camera. Exactly. Man. <laughs> and Ghost World. <laughs> it's ghost is an entirely different other film. I forgot what word it was. I was like, ghost we, people? No, it's not ghost which people. Is, ghost. Just to say, if if we were rating ghosts right now, I'd give that a solid 7 out of 10. Which one? I know, oh, I'm thinking of ghosts. Oh, plural, ghost, which ghost was is the Nick Broomfield um, movie. Uh, the one I'm thinking of is Patrick Swayze. Yeah, that's ghost. Good, solid Hollywood entertainment. But this film, Ghost World, I'd give a uh, excellent 8 out of 10. Uh, it holds up really well. It's the, one of those early 2000s movies where like Johnny I was also obsessed with this kind of era of indie filmmaking that, that you know that was my year that, that was my time man Zach Braff speaks to me Ghost World is the best thing since sliced bread but this is one of those ones that holds up really well the, the uh, comic book aesthetic and touches of magic reali realism leads to greater truths which I feel like this has more emotional intelligence than uh, funny pages which uh, like we said purports to have a sort of grotty gritty real world but it isn't quite that pleasant to be around whereas ghost world speaks of a greater intelligence with a sprinkle of a little bit of um a comic book uh, magic aesthetic on top of it to really sell its realism so eight out of ten very good excellent stuff I also want to give it eight out of ten. Hey. Gosh darn it, we agree. Damn it. <laughs> um, I also, yeah, I think it really holds up. It kind of is in that. It was always in that kind of my eighteen-year-old me kind of movie, but um, unlike Garden State, I think it has aged really well. I think the character acting is, well, the character actors that are in it around the, the two leads are great. Um, I think it's funny at times, I think it's sad at times, I think it's the right length, I think it's well put together. Um, I think maybe it's missing a spark, which maybe stops me giving it a 10 or a 9, but I'm not going to give many films a 10 or a 9. So, but no, really happy to give it a 8. So that's both of us, 8 out of 10. So Fantastic. Funny Pages, 4.5, and, a and um, Ghost World, 8 out of 10. And Ghost, 7 out of 10. <laughs> Um, I don't know, I would give Ghost six or seven. Yeah, it's, it's about that. And that sort of uh, 80s Hollywood mullet Patrick Swayze. Yeah. What a yeah. great movie star he was. Wow. We should do a movie on him soon. Yeah. Maybe Point Break. Although we could, well, yeah. I was the issue is we, maybe we can do a new Keanu Reeves movie with Point Break. Whoa. Um, because obviously Patrick Swayze, unfortunately, is not yes. making movies anymore. Um, sadly. sadly. And on that sad news, that brings us to the end of this week's on the downer ending. And remember uh, to follow us on all our socials. Socials, what a horrible word. Follow us on our socials, like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Ding, 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 ding. Untitled Film Podcast, Facebook and Instagram, and whatever it was I said about Twitter. I think it's Untitled with C and J. Untitled with CJ, I think. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm gonna. I'm, oh uh, no, and J. No, yeah. C, C, J, and P, J, and, and the bear. Um, C, 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 B, C and J and the, and the Dibleys. Peanut butter and jelly otters. C, Jodge and, and the Codge Bodge. Um, where, where is it? Where's, tw where's Twitter gone? <laughs> I got. There's a twit in here. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Untitled with C, J. Okay. Untitled with C, and C, J. And to whoever took the name Untitled Film Pod. <laughs> I will find you, and I will kill you. And, and on, on that note... Yeah. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.